welcome everyone to today's webinar, title of which is Changing the Therapeutic Paradigm in the Treatment of Acute Type A Dissections. Um, I would like to thank Artivion for organizing and supporting this event. My name, as you heard, is Max Bagai. I'm a cardiac surgeon in London, United Kingdom, at the King's College Hospital. And we are a group of uh, hospitals within a network providing treatments for acute aortic syndromes. And we've just started using this AMDS device. So we're very excited to hear from our panel of international experts um, today. The agenda um, today spans over an hour with three presentations, and we'll have a few minutes after each to ask a few questions. And hopefully, as long as we're in the allocated uh, schedule, we'll be able to have about 10 minutes at the end for a further Q&A. Without further delay, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Michael Moon, Director of Aortic Surgery at the Mazankowski Alberta Heart Institute in Edmonton, Canada. Dr. Moon's main interest is aortic surgery, uh, in both open and endovascular. He has developed not only the aortic services, but also minimal access heart valve surgery. Uh, he's one of the first surgeons to implant the AMDS device and has already published uh, their results in Canada. So, Michael, thank you for joining us today and giving us a talk on patient selection and imaging surveillance. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we first implanted the AMDS device back in March of uh, 2017 within the DARTS trial, and uh, we've had uh, experience over the last five years with the device. Uh, this morning I'll be speaking of, or this afternoon for you guys, we'll be speaking about patient selection and surveillance. Uh, just briefly, uh, I think it's incredibly important that uh, when you are using any new device, in particular with the AMDS, that you ensure that you are uh, picking the patients appropriately, but uh, equally identifying which patients uh, this device should not be used. Uh, and then uh, I'll go over uh, some observations and uh, experience with what we've had for surveillance. Uh, the AMDS device is uh, it's designed for the use with the Debakey one aortic dissections, and I think the most important point we have is that the primary entry tear must be in the ascending aorta and aortic root, and ideally at least ten to fifteen millimeters proximal to the origin of the nominate artery or further away. So anything from the aortic root up to the distal ascending uh, would be uh, an appropriate uh, pathophysiology for this type of device. Uh, looking specifically at the, that recommendation, you need at least 10 millimeters from the nominate artery to accommodate for this felt cuff, which is at the proximal end of uh, the device. Uh, and in this uh, schematic, you can see that if you don't have a 10 millimeter space uh, proximal to the nominate artery, the felt cuff will interact or potentially uh, obstruct uh, flow into the nominate brachio or brachiocephalic head vessel. And the most important thing is that this is not a treatment for a, a type B dissection with retrograde extension into a zone zero or the ascending aorta. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, I think, an incredibly important point because you're, it's, not, it's not the right device. As you can see, uh, there is a bare metal stent component distally that sits across the aortic arch and into the proximal and mid-descending thoracic aorta. So any entry tear that this sits across will not be occluded. Uh, the bare metal stent will allow for ongoing perfusion of any large tears that are not resected within the aortic arch descending thoracic aorta, and you'll have ongoing flow and pressurization of the false lumen, which will lead potentially to ongoing growth and degeneration of that aorta. That being said, the communication between the true and false lumens uh, as a result of small uh, tears or uh, due to the intercostals uh, does not prevent uh, remodeling. Uh, if the AMDS is implanted with an open distal or hemiarch procedure, uh, you know, you can't treat tears in the aortic arch, the descending thoracic aorta. So, you know, I want to keep on emphasizing this because uh, we have had uh, this device implanted in, uh, in retrospect, was, was a type B dissection, retrograde extension into zone zero, 
with a large entry tear. But uh, what we saw was that there was an unidentified large entry tear in the descending thoracic aorta, and the, and the aorta has continued to grow. So, you know, just to summarize again, if the entry tear is not resected, an AMDS should not be deployed in the arch. This is an ideal candidate for uh, an Avita, uh, a total arch replacement. Uh, and, you know, that's the, I think, the key point when utilizing this device. Uh, we always recommend uh, pre discharge CTA, chest, abdomen, pelvis. And then in our hospital, depending, as long as we have no specific concerns about the aorta, we will re image them at three months and uh, at six months if indicated. Uh, and as with all uh, aortic dissections, annual imaging is uh, definitely recommended. So I just want to present a case uh, where we have. Uh, one of our patients that was enrolled in the DARTS trial, which was uh, the first uh, multi-center trial looking at the AMDS device. Uh, and this is a patient from 2018. This is a 72-year-old male presenting the DeBakey-1 aortic dissection, central chest pain, history of hypertension, and otherwise well. Uh, this is his preoperative CT scan. Uh, it's a DeBakey-1 dissection. There's an ascending aortic entry tear. Uh, the dissection extended into the aortic root and into all three head vessels. The true lumen was collapsed, and uh, the visceral vessels did originate off the true lumen. Uh, further distal uh, that's not seen on this CT scan is a communication at the iliac level. So just running through the CT scan again here. And I think this is very common uh, presentation for what we would expect for many of our debakey one dissections. Uh, the patient had right axillary cannulation, hypothermic circulatory arrest with anti-grid cerebral perfusion. Uh, a biobentol was performed with a magnet ease uh, a valve, uh, as is the case for a hemiarch. It's an open distal anastomosis, and we sized uh, preoperatively for the AMDS 5540 tapered uh, device. Uh, the patient did, unfortunately, develop a uh, ventilator-acquired pneumonia and, uh, uh, was a little bit slow to wean, and he ended up with a tracheostomy, but his one-week CT scan uh, is shown here. And I want to highlight a few things that are important. Uh, we did have the false lumen persist in the aortic arch with anti-grade uh, perfusion of the false lumen. And you can see here, just uh, uh, anteriorly, the false lumen is being perfused in an anti fashion, and this was due to a communication in the left common carotid artery. As we went, go to two months, what we have seen is that the we still had persistent false lumen filling in the aortic arch, again, anti-grade. The descending thoracic aorta filled in a retrograde fashion, and we started seeing thrombus within the aortic arch in the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, in the distal false lumen, it was still perfused, but the true lumen was better expanded. At one year, uh, the false lumen is completely obliterated within the aortic arch. There was anti-grade filling had stopped, so that communication at the left common carotid artery, uh, it was no longer present. Uh, and I think a key point was it was not large enough to prevent uh, remodeling. The true lumen continued to re-expand uh, and in the descending thoracic aorta, and beyond the distal uh, aspect of the stent, the false lumen did persist, but again, as a result of uh, retrograde uh, retrograde filling. So when we compare one year and uh, two year imaging, uh, one year is on the left and two year imaging is on the right, we can see that the aortic arch continued to remodel uh, out to two years. Uh, the descending thoracic aorta uh, is virtually healed. Uh, there is some evidence of uh, some thickened uh, aorta as of the false lumen is uh, remodeling. And when we compare our two-year imaging on the left and our three-year imaging on the right, uh, the aorta has continued to remodel. So this patient was seen in the late 2021, uh, and this was his three-year fall of imaging, and he'll have uh, four-year imaging in the fall uh, for uh, a repeat CT scan. So, Key points of this case, what we have seen with longitudinal imaging is that remodeling is a process that may occur over many years. Uh, remodeling is most likely to occur in areas that are supported by the bare stent, and I think that this is something that we would anticipate based on what we know from uh, treatment of type B dissections. Remodeling is less likely to occur if there's proximal true lumen or fall and false lumen communication. 
either with the presence of a Dane, a distal anastomotic neuentrotere, or within communications within the head vessels. The larger this communication or uh, with multiple communications, the less likely you will have remodeling. Uh, however, small communications do not prevent uh, complete remodeling of the aortic arch and proximal descending thoracic aorta. And depending on the extent of distal communication, remodeling may occur beyond the distal aspect of the bare stent. In this patient's uh, scenario, all the visceral vessels did arise from the true lumen, which was uh, obviously a, a predictor of uh, excellent remodeling. So, you know, this slide just goes to show that if the primary entry tear is resected, uh, when might the arch grow? And it would potentially grow is if I said we have a Dane, which is an absent, which is absent in over 90% of cases uh, where we have used the AMDS. Uh, but if there are entry tears and communications in arch branch vessels, uh, this is a situation where the aortic arch may continue to grow. A small communication, uh, I suspect, will likely remain stable or allow the arch to remodel. And this is different than an ex a dissection that extends into one of the head vessel. So dissection that extends into head vessel but does not communicate, uh, I think, will actually heal very, very nicely. Uh, you know, the end result is we have shown within our DARCH trial that the AMDS is a safe and efficacious adjunct to the current gold standard hemiarch procedure for the treatment of acute DeBakey 1 dissections, and it is designed to be implanted at the distal anastomosis during a hemiarch procedure. And the consequence of multiple head vessel communications is that the false lumen may not thrombose and in some cases may continue to grow. Uh, this is a similar pathophysiology to that of uh, a Dane. And it's a function of the flow and pressurization of the false lumen, but it does not preclude implantation of the AMDS for malperfusion, uh, but the arch modeling in the case of communications is less predictable. Uh, Professor Kemferta recently published their experience with a resolution of uh, malperfusion of head vessels and their experience with the AMDS has been uh, excellent. Questions? All right. Thank you, Michael. That was bang on time. Um, I can't see any questions at the moment uh, from the uh, from the participants, but I have a few myself. Um, I mean, with regards to the actual deployment, you obviously have a, a, the longest, uh, in terms of time period, experience with these devices. So, have you ever come across a, you know, I guess a, an individual where you've uh, decided to implant and then you have then opened the aorta, you've got to that point and you are inserting your device. Have you had any problems actually getting you down there in terms of resistance? Because that's something that, you know, in an acute dissection, as opposed to say uh, other more chronic states where people might wire up from below, you're going in blind. Um, have you had any issues with that? And and how do you sort of uh, exclude patients to make sure you don't have you know, peri procedural or intra procedural problems? Uh, that's a, that's an excellent question. Uh, one of the things that I emphasize within my own group uh, and when I speak with other uh, physicians is that. You need, you need to start off with excellent imaging, and I think you need to be able to visualize the descending thoracic aorta well with uh, an appropriate contrast uh, pacification to ensure that you don't have a large entry tear uh, in which you may be able to pass into the, uh, the false lumen. You know, obviously that would be a contraindication uh, to the device. Uh, with respect to deployment, we have had zero uh, issues. Uh, we've had 100% uh, uh, success with uh, device deployment both within the DARTS trial and our subsequent experience over the last five years. Uh, the device uh, does, it's very different than the, the Thorflex device in that it's a lot more flexible. Uh, we do not deploy our device uh, or insert the device over a wire. And uh, as I said, we've had no issues or uh, the development of any uh, tears uh, deliver, delivering the device. It does, uh, it, the, the design with the pigtail distally being flexible, uh, it does track into the true lumen very well. And, uh, you know, I I do tell people that if you do feel more comfortable deploying over a wire, uh, the device is uh, designed to allow you to do that. 
but uh, our practice uh, when I train surgeons in our own group or in Canada, uh, there's all all of the Canadian surgeons that implant uh, deploy without a wire and uh, none of us have had any technical issues. So uh, it does sometimes there's a little bit of resistance during advancing the device, but uh, uh, it's, you know, I, I tell people to practice with uh, the model that uh, Artavian will you know, have that you can feel in terms of how much resistance it does take and it would be similar. But uh, my biggest concern, uh, as I think you're alluding to, is potentially uh, damaging uh, the dissected aorta, but uh, we have not had any situation uh, yet. And, you know, I think that having uh, implanted the device, uh, you know, I feel very comfortable that it, it would be safe to do so in the, in the manner it's described. Thank you very much. So, uh, I mean, I think the, the thing to take away from that is when you look on your CT scan, you're looking for tears that, that in the area of that uh, proximal descending thoracic aorta that you cannot see when you look down into your open aorta. And I think that is that that is a very important thing to to take away. And uh, hopefully, your CT scan is good enough to show that area. Um, now, a, a question that has come up from the panel, which is, I think, a very good question from Antonia Thomas, is asking about what treatments do you put your patients on, on discharge? Aspirin, clopidogrel, or, or nothing? Yeah, I, I treat this, uh, I don't, you know, similar for my uh, TVAR patients, I don't put them on aspirin or any antiplatelet agent. Uh, if uh, we have a, a root replacement, uh, if we're doing a bantol in that case, I will place the patient on an antiplatelet agent, but specifically for the device, we have not uh, been starting patients on uh, antiplatelet agents uh, with the AMDS. Uh, we've obviously been following our patients from the DARTS trial and subsequently, and we've not been having any uh, issues of uh, uh, concern where we are thinking they may be developing uh, emboli or TIAs or strokes, fortunately. Great. Right. Thank you very much, Michael. I think just keeping to time now, um, we'll uh, come back to you at the end uh, in the Q&A. Um, so next, uh, we are joined by Professor Kempfert. He is a senior surgeon at the Berlin Heart Center in Germany. Jörg is well known uh, not only for his expertise in aortic surgery, but also minimal access valve surgery. Uh, he's implanted over 100 AMDS devices and has presented his outcomes at the STS meeting. So thank you, Jörg, for joining us today. And I believe you are going to present the clinical evidence to date and ongoing studies around the AMDS device. Over to you. Thanks for the kind introduction. So dear colleagues, my pleasure to share with you some experience in regard to the AMDS device. So let's uh, get started and have a look on the uh, approval trial. Michael was alluding to that a minute ago, and this was called DARTS-1. It's now published, so you can have a look in the, the publication if you're interested in the more data details. But just kind of uh, to summarize a little bit, it was close to 50 patients, typical type 1, type A acute dissections. Um, what is important to uh, uh, as a take-home message here is that the implant time of the device was less than five minutes. So basically, you do your standard hemiarch procedure, uh, using your uh, common setup, and then you add the implantation of this device. This will stabilize your, pro your distal anastomotic site. So Michael has alluded to that. Uh, the absence of Dane, so new um, anastomotic uh, tiers have been documented in over 90%. So this is very good. It obviously will help tremendously with uh, resolvement of uh, acute malperfusion. Uh, because the device is not covered, you will not expect any risk of spinal cord injury, and we have seen zero patients so far. In regard to the other outcome data, you can see Saturday mortality is in the usual range to what you would expect, around 13%, but there have been no AMDS-related uh, adverse events being reported so far. Now, if we have a closer look to the intraoperative details, um, you can see that uh, 26 uh, of these uh, patients, so more than 50% presented with some sort of malperfusion, uh, and the resolution of these uh, malperfusion was seen in 95% of patients. So very good and strong data uh, in favor of uh, uh, efficacy in regard to resolvement of acute malperfusion. So if we now have a look at a more uh, uh, detailed CT follow-up, and this real data is soon to be uh, presented and published, you can see now that uh, the more distal you go, 
uh, obviously when it, uh, structures are not supported by the stent, you will see uh, some uh, uh, aortic growth. This is the usual story. Uh, and this is actually similar to a frozen elephant trunk procedure. This is the idea of the device that you want to kind of uh, shift the residual disease more to the distal part where it can be easily uh, be managed by interventional techniques. So definitely you don't want to have problems in the arch. And this is here documented in uh, the zone A. So if you have a look at the columns on the upper right, you see total aortic diameter, which is the only thing that is going to trigger a redo. And you can see that there is a uh, in the dots trial, 100% uh, success rate. The more distal you go, you'll see some yellow, which means there is some increase in uh, total aortic diameter in selected patient. And there's a tiny red column, which re means that the patient required a reintervention and going to come back to that in a minute. Now, um, in regard to cerebral malperfusion, this is always a kind of a highly debatable topic on what the best manage is going to be. So we just have kind of published our result in regard to uh, AMDS in addition to a, a simple uh, open uh, anastomosis or hemiarch. And you can see that uh, the majority of vessels showed uh, a significant uh, reopening uh, pattern. So you can see a, a case example here, almost completely occluded preoperatively and then just by a simple open anastomosis and uh, addition of the device, uh, it opened up very nicely. So it seems to be very effective uh, in regard to uh, this small perfusion. Now, in regard to decision making, and I just have to, add, uh, to kind of mirror what Michael was alluding to in a minute ago, this device is designed to be used in patients that has an acute type 1, type A, but you need to be 100% sure that your entry site need, is in the ascending. So, in other words, you need to make sure that you surgically resect the entry site. So, the device is not going to work and it's also not intended uh, to work in a patient where you have a TRD arch or the proximal descending. Those patients still require a total arch, typically with a frozen elephant uh, device. Let's have a look on uh, kind of our experience now. So the device has become routine uh, a procedure for all type A, uh, type 1 patients, as long as the entry tier is clearly in the ascending. And I have to say, and as long as there is no suspected connective tissue disease. So very young patients with suspected connective tissue disease problems, uh, I'm a, a strong uh, uh, opponent for um, going for more aggressive uh, frozen elephant procedure uh, right away, but this is not the majority, obviously, of our patients. So you have seen the device, so it is very easy to use. This is reflected very well as we have now trained or basically not really trained, but 13 surgeons have uh, used the device in our center. So the training basically consists of having a look on a video, doing an implantation, a model, and that's it. So it's more like a do one, teach one. So it's very easy. Uh, and anybody who can do um, a hemiarch procedure can actually use this device. Now let's have a look on the, uh, uh, let's say, real life data. And this might create some discussions here because now we have used it in more than 100, 100 cases. And as you can see here in the preoperative uh, kind of baseline characteristic, 35 patients presented with acute neurological deficits. So in other words, this is a kind of a very kind of a negative selection so very kind of a sick cohort, and why is that? Because any patient that come in with a kind of a hemiplegia uh, or kind of a occluded, uh, carotid, any, or with visceral uh, ischemia, all these really, really sick patients, you definitely do not want to have a lengthy procedure like uh, with a frozen elephant percent, uh, procedure. And then other patients where this dissection is less complicated, most likely the colleagues are less likely to use uh, this device. So this is also why, uh, if you have a look here on the um, on the uh, pen classification, you have a significant patient that have a, a mild perfusion. Now, if you look at the more interoperative details, you can see that the paint uh, to cut time uh, is only six hours. This is due to the, our kind of a, a network that we have established in Berlin. So the uh, diagnosis is typically relatively fast and transfer to our hospital is fast, so we will be able also to include those that typically might not uh, be surviving if you have longer pain to uh, cut uh, procedures. And this is especially important, as we all know, for visceral malperfusion, which is a very tricky uh, patient cohort. So our standard approach is to cool down to 28 degrees using right axillary artery. 
Um, I personally use unilateral integrate brain perfusion, but obviously some colleagues also have used in a series here bilateral, which is doable, and even two patients received a retrograde with a deep hypothermic uh, arrest. So now the um, route is um, has to be managed as uh, you uh, similar fashion to what you do in a frozen elephant or a standard hemiarch procedure. And the complete AMDS device expansion we have seen in 97 of 100 patients, which also means that in three patients we have not seen a complete opening of the device. This is a one case definitely was due to severe kinking, and the other two, I honestly I have no clue yet. So this is also something that we have a look on. Uh, once more devices are going to be used worldwide, but in, in a usual case, the deployment is very straightforward. So now let's have a look on the post-operative data. So overall, the mortality is obviously uh, higher as expected because this was a very sick cord with a significant portion having a severe malperfusion preoperatively. Now, if you have a look at the new post-operative neurological deficit, this is also quite high, 18 out of 100. And this can, again, be um, at least in part be explained to uh, the fact that in 35% of these patients, there was a preoperative uh, detectable neurological uh, deficit with 17% having clear cerebral malperfusion in terms of uh, subtotal or total occlusion of supraortic vessels. Now, the malperfusion resolved in the majority of patients without any additional measurements. However, uh, 13 patients required uh, some additional interventions that could be early, which is nine out of these 100, or more uh, in a more chronic fashion in four of those patients. You can have a look on the list in the new slide on all these kind of events. I don't want to go through all of them, but just that you see what kind of patient we are talking here. We had mesenteric ischemia, which had then a non-covered extension of the AMDS or a selective reopening of these vessels. We had um, uh, definitely also some patients that require a distal extension of the stent into the abdominal uh, space, but also stenting of the uh, um, uh, iliac artery due to a uh, residual sub, uh, total occlusion. So this is a typical kind of a subset of those patients. And the uh, stent is helpful to resolve uh, uh, the acute malperfusion, but obviously some patients are going to uh, require additional treatment. This has to be expected. Now, similar to uh, Mike Moon's uh, experience, we also have now a very kind of long experience with this device. And this is why I also like to show you three different cases here. So this is a typical, very good case. So it's a primary ascending uh, entry, no arch tear, no cerebral malperfusion as expected. The device really performs uh, outstanding here with complete heal, uh, healing of the arch and the descending. So this is an ideal case. On the other hand, uh, we have seen that it's very effective to uh, treat uh, also even distal malperfusion. This is the left leg that was gone and without further reintervention opened up uh, postoperatively. This is one of the patients that had a preoperatively uh, involvement of the superiority vessels. You can see that one of the carotid was uh, um, occlude, not it was stenosed, but not due to thrombose of the false lumen, but due to compression of the true lumen, which is a completely different ballgame. And this opened up on both sides without further uh, intervention. But I also want to draw your attention to this kind of a scenario. So in case you have an entry which involves the innominate artery or even in the region of the left subclavian, you still can use the device, but then you uh, cannot do a zone zero, but then you have to do a zone uh, two, for instance, a procedure. In this case, it's an AMDS with a lupi branch prosthesis and so the branching of the innominate and the left carotid artery. So this is also doable. And then uh, to sum up one, let's say maybe a word of warning or kind of a, just a case example that we should maybe discuss also together in a minute. This is a case that clearly on a preoperative CT scan has a large entry in the left subclavian uh, artery as it can be seen here in the yellow circles. So we did a typical uh, zone zero a hemiarch was the AMDS, and then the six months uh, CT showed growth of the both the proximal uh, de descending as well as the distal arch due to the uh, pressurization of the false lumen uh, due to the uh, large entry into the left subclavian. And so now we need to discuss what can we do if those patients might bounce back, and it's just a matter of time and a matter of numbers until you see a patient that still have negative remodeling after 
a new device, this has to be expected. So now there are two different options. Either you can go for classic frozen elephant. However, as we all know, this is a quite a nasty procedure. And so we decided in this case to do an, uh, uh, a deep branching of uh, the innominate and the left um, carotid. And then did the carotid subclavian bypass and occluded with an amplex uh, occlusion device, the left subclavian, and this eliminated the pressurization of the uh, false lumen and hopefully a CT follow-up is going to show no positive remodeling. But this is definitely one of these scenarios where we not, do not know yet on how to kind of uh, uh, treat these patients the first time and whether or not we might have a closer look of those patients in the future and may maybe have prophylactic or very early intervention with the carotid subclavian bypass and inclusion intervention of the left subclavian. So take home message, uh, the AMDS uh, does not add substantial technical complexity. It's actually very easy to use. It has demonstrated high reliability and also seems to uh, be very uh, promising in treatment of acute malperfusion. In the majority of cases, we have seen very good uh, uh, positive remodeling. However, there are a couple of uh, clinical scenarios where maybe this device is not uh, perfectly suited. And this is definitely those that have an entry in the arch and potentially those that have a large re-entry uh, in the left subclavian, which is going to feed uh, and pressurize the false loom uh, during follow-up. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Jörg. Um, so uh, we've been looking at the questions and actually there's uh, still no further questions coming in. So I'm gonna ask you a little bit about your age restrictions. Uh, I mean, you've got fantastic results there. You've obviously got a lot of experience using this device and you pointed out a few of the uh, nuances of how to choose your patients appropriately. Um, so an anatomy is one thing, but in terms of age, it, I mean, it's an emergency type A dissection. So, you know, you might see somebody who you think there might be some inherited disorder there, but, uh, you know, you don't have time to really get to the bottom of it. You've got to get the patient into theater. Um, so instead, do you have age restrictions for various reasons? So below a certain age, you think mm, probably not the right person to put a stent at this stage. And what about above a certain age? Would you? Yeah. So there, obviously, there's no restriction above a certain age. <laughs> I mean, uh, all the people because it's so so easy and so straightforward doesn't extend the procedure. I'm also happy to do it in an 86 year old. That is not a point. But in the younger patient, I'm a little bit more hesitant. And there are two reasons. I mean, if you have, let's say, an iatrogenic dissection, then it's crystal clear. But those patients that have a type A dissection, age, let's say, 50 or less, I mean, what is the reason that these patients dissect? And the majority of those patients will have some sort of connective tissue disorder. And so our strategy would be to go for frozen elephant procedure right away. Now, we are a very large center, obviously, and we can also do these procedures in the middle of the night. But however, if you are working in a smaller center, then there might be a smaller group of kind of surgeons that are capable of doing these procedures, and they might not be available in the middle of the uh, night and weekend. So in these scenarios, I think it is better to do a simple open classic hemiarch procedure, because then for the future, if these patients show growth in the arch, you still can refer them to a center of excellence or have the most experienced uh, aortic surgeon doing a redo with a, a kind of a frozen elephant, it's much easier if there's no stent in the arch. So if the patient is young and there is connective tissue disease suspected, either go for the frozen elephant right away or do not implant a stent to not kind of uh, create problems in the future. However, this is not the majority of type A dissection. The majority is entry in the, is in the ascending, atrosclerotic or hypertension is the root cause, and they typically a patient are above 60 or 70. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, some people might use the argument of not using FETs, frozen in inheritable disease patients either, because obviously they continue to grow. But um, I guess what if you can also put a stent inside AMDS? So similar to extending from a FET, you can extend from, go right up to where you need to, I guess, in case there is distal. Um, uh, I think that's a question that I, I was gonna put to the panel because I think Michael may have some experience in that. Um, I, uh, 
So in terms of your uh, uh, cannulation for your procedures, I saw you did one direct aortic there in that group, but I think if you're advising people that are using the AMDS device, you, your best option is to go for your auxiliary so that you can do anti-grade perfusion at the same time and, and give yourself more time for deployment. Uh, what makes you choose your strategy for that? So my personal strategy is that I go for a uh, cellular cannulation of the right axillary, so also do not use a graft, and I use a percutaneous vein. And then I go on pump, start to cool, and only then open the chest. Because then once I open the pericardium, I'm already at 30 degree, and if, if in, in case there is a kind of a rupture or any of those things, I'm cool enough to uh, directly start the procedure. Uh, for these easy procedures, like a standard hemi-arch plus an AMDS, I personally only use unilateral perfusion, uh, I, but I make sure to not have any steel. So I will clamp uh, the uh, left carotid and the left subclavian. However, also it is doable to use a perfusion catheter. Uh, so you can insert a catheter, then you can insert a stent, but then you would need to withdraw it, deploy the stent, and then reinsert it through the uh, cells of the stent. This is doable and has been done multiple times, but I find that too complicated, honestly. But if this is your routine practice, you maybe it's also a good argument to not change it. Yeah, I, I agree with I, Professor I like Kepler. Michael, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. I, I agree with uh, Professor Kepler. Uh, my strategy is unilateral and integrated cerebral perfusion. Uh, one of my colleagues does use uh, bilateral and the device uh, is amenable to uh, continuing to use your standard practice of cerebral protection. All right. Uh, what, what I could do, I could answer those questions that I typically got from my colleagues in my center because I have, we have now 13 uh, people that we had to, let's say, train. And so for me, what is most important is the sizing. So the sizing, there are four sizes, tapered and non-tapered. And you need to be able also in the middle of the night to measure these two kind of uh, anatomic uh, uh, um, sites. And one is the descending at the level of the pulmonary artery bifurcation. This is very easy. Everybody can do that in a standard CT scan. The other one is between the innominate artery and the left carotid. And this is more complicated because you can't really do it on a standard CT scan. You need to be able to do a, at least a multi-planar reconstruction or ideally a center line-based reconstruction. And this is something that not everybody can do in the middle of the night himself. And obviously radiologists are sometimes not available. So one kind of surgical walkaround is that you can use a 33 mitral sizer. And then if you open the arch and the 33 mitral sizer is smaller than the arch, you need to go for the larger version, the proximal larger version. Is it a smaller? You can go for the smaller one. So it's a good workaround if you're stuck in a case in the middle of the night and have no clue about center line reconstructions. That's a very good point. Um, I guess if you've got someone there to go running for the box, uh, that'll work nicely. But do you find, like here, in the terms of the quality of the CT scans are very variable because you're getting referrals from outside. That is something we have. And we don't really have the capability or the time to redo the CT scan unless if there's a sort of a good clinical reason rather than a device reason to, to do it. Um, I don't know if you have the same problem or Dr. Moon has the same problem there. Yeah, we, I, I think as all of us uh, see, many of our patients do come with uh, a PE study so the initial thought is that's a pulmonary embolus, and it's often very difficult uh, to visualize uh, definitely the, the distal uh, thoracic aorta in many cases. But, you know, I, one thing that uh, I do recommend is before we have the device selected, uh, so we, we can do a, or I'm able to do a, you know, multiplanar reconstruction, get a good accurate measurement. So I know what device I want uh, to use, but I don't, open the actual device until I look in the aortic arch uh, and inspect that. There have been a few cases where, uh, despite uh, you know a very good CT scan, 
showing no arch involvement uh, that intraoperatively obviously something has changed in that uh, interval period, but uh, either the tear is extended uh, into the arch or we've identified something that uh, was not uh, present. But, you know, I think that if you cannot visualize the descending thoracic aorta at all, you know, you should really, you know, ask while you're cooling, you know, ask your, uh, echo, you know, your anesthetist uh, to at least look at the descending thoracic error to make sure there's no large tears. And, and I think that most echocardiographers can get a pretty good assessment of the descending thoracic error just to convince yourself, you know, it's, you open up, you see the big tear in the ascending aorta, the, it's a big root, everything makes sense. But uh, if it's a P study, I will have my uh, cardiac anesthetist uh, at least look at the descending thoracic error to make sure there's nothing there. And, you know, they have not missed anything yet. Uh, it's been confirmed on the post-operative CT scan that there was nothing present. But uh, imaging is incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael, I was just going to ask you, because, I mean, one question I think people are wondering is if you can possibly stent into these, um, into the MDS device, say if there is future remodeling and it's it, there is expansion. Um, what is your experience with that? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we just uh, published, uh, we just got accepted uh, a few weeks ago in the annals, uh, a case report, uh, at least it's the first of my knowledge where a patient uh, had the AMDS device deployed. There was a, a successful remodeling proximally, but the patient had a symptomatic uh, you know, 10 centimeter aneurysm. So they ended up having a cooked T branch device deployed to treat that, but they were able to seal, uh, you know, there was no endo leak, uh, so no type three leak. Uh, so the device does seal. And I think intuitively it did make sense that you should be able to do that. Uh, you know, conceptually, I didn't view it any different than a, a covered uh, a covered thoracic stent graft, but uh, but that was the one thing that uh, it, what we were wondering. We believed it would be the case, uh, but uh, if you have appropriate modeling proximally, that uh, uh, you will be able to seal adequately uh, for any subsequent uh, endovascular interventions. If you do have, if you still have false lumen outside the the device, uh, meaning the aorta has not remodeled. Uh, you know, similar to even if you have a thoracic, uh, a covered stent graft, then I think that uh, that would not be a, an appropriate intervention. But if the aorta has remodeled, as we are seeing in uh, the majority of our cases in the distal aortic arch, uh, I think that uh, it's an excellent, uh, excellent option that is available to you. Um, a question to, to both of you. Uh, as I presume you will be told as soon as uh, the professor uh, Benusi is online, but uh, I think at the moment we're still waiting. Um, but a question for both of you. One one thing I get asked and uh, I had to deal with to start is the felt. So when you've opened up and the felt is all scrunched up and you're trying, you know, you, you want to nicely, because uh, you're told to put your four sutures in and, and so on. How do you deal with that? Uh, over time, you must have come up with techniques of, of probably dealing with that. Um, so what we could do, we could have a look on a, on a one minute kind of a implantation video, if you like, and then we can explain better. Sure. On that. And uh, as long as we wait for uh, Dr. Bernussi. Okay, so let me do that. Do you see that? Not yet, huh? No, well, we can see your front slide, yeah. Oh. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Good. Okay, that's the device, we all know that. Now we are already on the... Still... Oh, okay, there we go. So this is the insertion, as Michael was uh, referring to, typically no wire is required because we have that nice pigtail. We are in unilateral brain uh, um, perfusion with occluded uh, carotid and subclavian to avoid any steel. And then this plastic cover is very helpful to get the device into the arch. Then, as you mentioned, it is advisable to do the four use sutures to stabilize everything. And this should be done uh, over an external felt strip. And this is also going to um, be the start-off point for your running suture later on. So I use the 
One at six o'clock with extra long uh, three proline, and the others at uh, nine, three, and twelve with standard proline sutures. And then once everything is in place, you simply pull this uh, um, suture, and it's going to deploy this stent. And then you have these felt thing. And uh, I fully agree that especially in smaller aorta, it looks a little bit scary, and you even uh, kind of uh, asking yourself whether or not this thing might create stenosis. What I can tell you, I've never seen that so far. And also, what you need to, what we all need to understand that this is nitinol, and you are uh, still re relatively cold, so it's going to rewarm, expand further on. So once you have uh, everything in place, you go for your one layer of kind of sandwich, and only then you attach your surgical graft. And this is. Uh, uh, the idea is that with this technique, uh, you have uh, most likely zero chance of creating a Dane. So this is a standard 30 millimeter graft, and once everything is obviously uh, sutures, you uh, clamp your graft and then can reperfuse. So with the felt, um, I, for me, it really helps if you first do your four sutures, because it helps you to equally distribute uh, the felt. And also, it sometimes helps to open it a little bit with forceps or two forceps and make sure, or well, just understand that this is nitinol, so it's going to further warm up. Michael, do you have any specific tricks to get rid of the felt mess? Uh, no, I, I think your, your, your video actually shows it very well. One of the things that we did try and do is uh, we got very comfortable with the device and we thought we could simplify the procedure by uh, removing that external felt, but then we started having... Uh, and we started observing that we were having Danes develop again. And, uh, you know, that's the one thing that we went back to the external felt and the Danes disappeared. Uh, I, I think it's incredibly important. And, you know, most or many surgeons, uh, especially when we're doing a lot of aortic arch surgery, we, we do try and minimize how much felt we have exposed. But if you want to successfully use this device, uh, the instructions for use, the IFU, uh, should be followed, and it will result in, uh, you know, the absence of Danes. Uh, to uh, Mr. Begay's point, I think it's very important that when you are doing your felt sandwich layer that the assistant does straighten out the inner felt cuff to avoid any bunching. Uh, that, that's a, a very important step. Uh, to avoid any stenosis, but like you just described, if you are stretching that inner felt while you do your uh, felt sandwich, you don't get any stenosis. Uh, and then that second anastomosis uh, with the Dacron to your uh, reconstructed distal, it, it's a very, very fast anastomosis because that whole distal is very, very solid. It's very uh, easy to manipulate it. And actually it's a, it's a very quick hemostatic suture line. Uh, so, yeah, it's an excellent video, and I do recommend that people use the external felt. As I said, many people ask if they can avoid it, but, uh, you know, our personal experience was we started having Danes uh, without that. I think it is important to create that sandwich uh, distally. Yeah, that's very useful. Thank you very much. In fact, what, what we do is, is kind of what you're saying, Michael. Uh, I get a marker pen because there's one marker on it, and I get the assistant to stretch it out. And I put my four points quickly, so I, it can then scrunch back, shrink back down, and I know where my four points are, and then I can just suture that. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe I can ask Michael because he has also kind of done many procedures. What do you think, of Michael, about let's say zone uh, uh, two, or just to keep it simple, a zone one uh, aim the S procedure if the anominate has a kind of a tear or if the kind of tear is too close to the anominate that you feel unsafe to do the classic aim the S procedure and then use a branch surgical prosthesis? Yeah, so uh, I think that probably since we have completed the DARTS trial, I'd say about a quarter of our implants are uh, a zone one implant where we have debranched the anominate artery. Uh, Reimplanted with a 10 millimeter, 12 millimeter graft more proximally, and then deployed at the level of the anominate, which is uh, transected and oversewn. So it's it's a very very proximal uh, uh, zone one. Uh, I have done a zone two as well, but then that's the whole separate issue as to if you're going to debranch the whole arch, revascularize all the head vessels. At what point uh, would you just not do a frozen elephant trunk? Uh, you know, I I think that. Uh, you know, my, our experience or my experience with the AMDS is 
we are having excellent arch remodeling. Uh, and in many cases, I do believe that one of the huge benefits of the device is its ability to address malperfusion. So in the cases where I'm going zone two and a patient also has clinical or radiographic malperfusion, I think the AMDS is an excellent option for that. But, uh, you know, I think one of the real issues, and it comes down to a philosophical way of how you approach the total arches, you know, if you're going to do zone two, reimplant the crud and revascularize the left subclavian, you know, I, I think it's very, very fair to, in that situation, consider an Avita, uh, Thoraflex, total arch replacement in that situation. But uh, in zone one, I think it's an excellent option. Uh, you know, it's one anastomosis to the nominate. Uh, distally, one proximally onto your uh, Dacron graft, and uh, the device again uh, is deployed without any difficulty. So, for me in our practice right now, if the, if we are within uh, 10 millimeters or less, or extends up to the nominate artery, uh, we still will use the AMDS, but do a zone one distal. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yeah, I agree, Michael. I think it's. Uh... You know, you may just be overcomplicating the issue um, and uh, go with what you would do safely anyway. Some people may ask, you know, are we, you know, you with a hemi arch with a standard procedure that most people have for these type A's, they have very good outcomes. Mortalities have come down to close to single figures. So, is this device going to possibly prolong or complicate what they already do and can affect that initial outcome? So, yes, we're doing this for possibly improved short-term outcomes uh, with the malperfusion and so on, but it's mainly for long-term remodeling. I mean, if we look at the data and we look at the technology behind it. Um, so, I think we just want to give reassurance that, no, it is not complicating it. And after you get to know it, it is a relatively simple thing to do as long as you certain things, as with any new technology, that you watch out for. So the selection criteria is, I think, very important. Uh, last but not least, um, we are joined by Professor Benussi, um, Director of Cardiac Surgery in Brescia Hospital in the lovely region of Lombardy um, in Italy. His expertise spans the whole breadth of cardiac surgery. So I'm not going to refrain by categorizing him into a sort of subspecialty. Uh, in, in fact, in the UK, we, we've got a, a word for this, it's called old school. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't uh, concentrate on the word old in this, it's a more a, a compliment, uh, Professor. So thank you for joining us today. And you're going to talk to us about how to start a new AMDS program. I just want you to briefly uh... Make present how our curve was uh, along this year of activity with the MDS uh, in, in my team in Brescia. We've done so far six cases. And, uh, you know, as it happens, uh, this, uh, this was the standard. This is not NORCA registry. So this is what the status was uh, worldwide and in Europe. But in my center, it was a little bit, even a little bit more complicated. So next, please. And uh, everybody, had their own ideas, uh, different uh, uh, cultural route, uh, different habits. Some would go for uh, uh, hemiage, some would go for uh, uh, more limited approaches with uh, clamping and minimal ascending aorta replacement uh, just to stay safe. Uh, some would do, not very confidently, but uh, Kazui and axillary cannulation. Next, please. And uh, uh, next, yeah, some would do axillary cannulation, but not very pleased about it. Sorry. And especially uh, circa rest with uh, with uh, with or without uh, uh, anti-grade or retrograde cerebral protection was not uh, was not very popular because dangerous because uh, uh, of let's say, conservative ideas and uh, different ideas also on how to perform the anastomosis. So when I just started uh, my experience there, I tried to bring in the, the concept of having the safest possible anastomosis. I'm really fond of double buttressing, sandwich buttressing with two different felts, distal and proximal, and glue in the middle. 
to this uh, uh, perspective, actually, the uh, the advent of the AMDS uh, made things uh, easier because when everybody was starting to do uh, reinforced uh, anastomosis and started to look at the open distal anastomosis, uh, came the AMDS. So let's go for cases quite click quickly. This is case number one. Typical type one, the vecchi dissection, 64 year old, good condition, and normally would have done uh, an any arch with uh, uh, maybe with uh, the branching of the of the nominate artery in a young patient. Uh, but uh, this is what we did with the AFDS, please. Okay, so this is preoperative. Typical type one. Next, please. With not very good uh, perfusion, go ahead, please. And uh, we just did the MBS and uh, semi typical uh, replacement with Kazuit integrate and always axillary cannulation. And this was the results. Very nice perfusion distally and some uh, uh, retrograde uh, reperfusion. Okay, and uh, people in the team, of course, started being curious because uh, this was really a short, uh, short uh, procedure. Next, please. And so I started doing it for really case two. I started uh, helping some other surgeons doing the procedure, and uh, uh, patient number two, uh, fifty-year-old, obese. Sorry. Go on. Uh, just start the uh, exact same stuff. Type one. We started paying attention that there is no second reentry. The reentry here is a few centimeters above the aortic valve. This chain, and uh, it was stopping just beyond the isthmus, so not very extensive. Again, same rule. Again, in this time we did the proximal first. I think this was the last time we did. We've been doing the proximal first. Uh, next, please, with the result. Basically, nearly always the needle cardioplegia, and also here, quite a nice result. And uh, so the team started to be all the more curious, and everybody wanted to do AMDS now because uh, because the distal anastomosis was now. Yes, it was with axillary. Yes, it was in uh, uh, deep hypothermic arrest uh, with uh, 28 degrees, only perfusing the axillary and with the other vessel cramped uh, and a matter of uh, three minutes deployment and uh, overall 15 minutes, uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, uh, Kazooie time. Next, please. So this is a more interesting case in which uh, Again, another colleague started doing MDS with me properly. Um, the Becky type, type 1 with extensive uh, involvement and malperfusion at supraortic branches and also very extensive distal uh, uh, diffusion. Next, please. Preoperative aspect. Still, we pay a lot of attention. There is no tear in the arch or distally because, in this case, we prefer, we still prefer not to do the MDS because we don't use a, an over the wire technique. We use it just uh, without any uh, guide. Uh, come on, please, chain. Same technique, but distal first. We started doing distal first because we don't like to put the clamp anymore. We don't want to damage the aorta possibly for to prevent uh, a swift uh, MDS deployment. Go on with the result, please. And this is the result. Uh, now, this is interesting because uh, again the, the arch is very good and. Uh, but uh, the patient showed the progression of distal, distal disease, which we are now planning to correct uh, together with our friends, vascular, vascular 
surgeons. And I think it's going to be pretty swift, uh, the, the, the covering, because in uh, just after the subclavian, uh, the, subclavian, the left subclavian, there is a perfect uh, sealing of the, of the initial part of the descending aorta. Next, please. This is a very complex case, which I treated myself. And uh, despite the patient was younger, uh, we discovered the patient had uh, ventricular dysfunction. Uh, aortic uh, uh, regurgitation very severe, total disruption of the root, uh, mitral regurgitation in a, mis in a neglected uh, Barlow disease. And so to make uh, the distal part shorter, actually we, I, having done a few, uh, I felt confident doing the MDS, please go. The, the right coronary was totally detached, the intima, so we have to oversue the right coronary and do a mental procedure. A and D S and during cooling we did the uh, mitral repair plus, uh, plus plus ring. Wow. Um, they are gone. There is some type of cardiomyopathy. You see the ventricle is very dilated and and uh, thin. Uh, let's go to the result, please. Okay, this is a, let's say, ascending is perfect. We had a good perfusion of all the organs. There is still residual uh, descending aorta dissection. But the patient has all the problems because she has low ejection fraction and uh, she's had a lot of problems with uh, end organ failure coming from, unfortunately, coming from before. Next, please. But I think uh, this is a different paradigm in a very complex procedure. This helped us simplify uh, the whole thing. So basically, uh, what are the take home, take home message in introducing the, thing, uh, the new technology in, uh, in my team? Uh, there are some specific aspects. We know that uh, we cardiac surgeons, uh, most of us, especially over 50, tend to be a little bit slave of our habits. And so, Introducing a new technology, total different uh, stuff, it, you know, it can raise some uh, bad uh, feelings at the beginning. Uh, there has been some uh, reluctancy to the small sizes, for instance, because uh, the small, the two sizes with the small cuff uh, make uh, the, the suturing a little bit, there is a little parking of tissue and some don't like it very much. Plus, uh, there is some perplexity about the possibility to to recover that that passage with uh, with endoprosthesis, and of course there is a fact that you are leaving the left the descending aorta totally uncovered. But from uh, the case I show you and uh, some other report from our colleagues, uh, if you have like you do in most of the cases a perfect sealing after the subclavian. Actually, this is a good starting point for to cover with paper everything. And then we must say uh, this technology does not prevent rerouting of the vessels, especially of the of the nominate, like we've been doing for years. Next, please. Uh, one thing that uh, fixed ninety percent of the of the problem was to circulate this first sheet of the sizes on WhatsApp on all the colleagues that were involved in the in the award in the on call uh, uh, dissection shifts with that in mind and with uh, somebody available on the telephone to, to address troubleshooting everybody was very relaxed there are only four sizes there are only two two sites you need to measure and two cut off uh, values, so it's very easy. Everybody now can uh, can uh, take their size their own. Next, please. It's very easy to to and quick to prepare. And uh, now, basically, uh, we are everybody in the team is more aware that uh, 
we can do with a normal uh, setup with uh, subclavian cannulation. Just clamping the scrotic vessel, you can do all of the cases. And we've tried in one case in which there was a doubt on the perfusion of the left, left carotid. Through the deployed AMDS, you can put uh, easily a Kazui cannula uh, in, the, in the room among the, the, the thread of the AMDS tent. So you can do anti selective uh, Kazui. Uh, the, the, the learning curve is really is really very very swift. Uh, now we are three operators to do it uh, independently, and uh, uh, other two are trained to begin. Maybe I'll help the first time, but uh, or they will help on themselves. But everybody is very very happy and enthusiastic about the next case. Uh, the effect of uh, having the stent inside, which has some radial force. The PTFE uh, strip that has a radial force that extends it makes uh, a double buttressing, double triple buttressing uh, technique even more solid and even more uh, strong to work with. Uh, so having the habit like like I had already to double buttress sandwich like all the anastomosis in only in our section, I think this is really a continuous uh, um, progression of the same uh, surgical philosophy. And uh, of course, the surgery becomes simpler. So everybody's happy. And then, as I said, you can still do the branching. And uh, you put a uh, Trifurcated Mache or whatever else, you can do the branching of one or two vessels. And the MDS. Next, please. So basically, this is this is uh, the conclusion we covered. Uh, simple uh, technology for uh, for even for complex cases to simplify them. Next and last, and so this is now our algorithm. We for the Beckett type two. We still uh, do most of the time with open anastomosis. We still change only the ascending aorta, and for anything else, we use uh, either INDS or a frozen elephant trap. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> you will probably hear these words in 15 minutes, but <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Bonusi. That was very good and very clear. Actually, that the whole technique phone thing is working fine online. Um, <laughs> very good. Yeah, we can see the phone, but not your face. Um, so, uh, actually we've, you know, there was one thing that you mentioned, uh, with regards to the technique that you used, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you obviously go down just to 28 degrees for your anti grade cerebral. Um, I was wondering if both Michael and Jörg also did the same thing. We. Go, well, uh, some of our partners go down to 20 degrees, uh, even with ACP. Uh, I go to 26 degrees. I also go 28 uh, uh, bladder temperature. But you know, we all know that at that time where you do the uh, unilateral brain perfusion, your venous temp or your temperature in the blood in the pump is typically 24 or so, right? So technically, you're 24 brain perfusion, but core temperature uh, 28. Yeah, we, we usually go to around 25 when we've got anti-grade. Um, so, uh, the, the, one of the questions, that, that there's a, one question that came up just while you were giving that talk was about uh, false lumen thrombosis rate. So, in your, I guess, and this can go to all of you, um, in terms of your follow-up, have you noticed a certain percentage that you can confidently say have thrombosed? Um, I mean, at least proximally down to your abdominal aorta, uh, or is it still too early to say? I just, uh, I think that, uh, I think, uh, professor comfort showed. Uh, the mature results of the darts trial where we were having uh, excellent rates of thrombosis. <laughs> excuse me within the. Aortic arch, uh, the further distal you get. In the distal descending thoracic aorta, because typically with the debate, the debate one dissections, you still have 
uh, communication between the true and false lumens as a result of uh, either iliac or visceral uh, osteal communications, uh, you are definitely less likely to see uh, thrombosis or remodeling uh, at the diaphragm visceral segments, which is uh, makes pathophysiologic sense. But we're seeing that over two thirds of our arches are completely healed. <clears throat> and in the cases where they still have false lumen being present, it was, uh, as I said, related to uh, Danes where we stopped using the external felt or uh, as a result of any uh, true lumen, false lumen communications of the head vessels. But uh, the small communications, uh, similar to that of a small Dane, uh, those ones do seem to be, they're definitely stable. And some of them, I suspect, over time will, uh, will resolve. So over 90%, you'd say? I would, yeah, it's it's getting close to that. I uh, It's definitely getting close. But some took uh, a few years. Uh, the case I showed, it, it took uh, two years before the arch had, uh, that false woman had disappeared. And, uh, you know, that was something that I was not expecting to see uh, based on the initial imaging. But uh, I think we're more consistently seeing uh, in the absence of large communications approximately uh, that those arches are healing. And maybe also we should not kind of, uh, uh, I think we should, it's fair to say that the, the experience of the device worldwide is still limited. So we have DARTS trial, so this was the approval trial, 50 patients only, but results are very good. Now we have uh, an ongoing post-market uh, registry, and we will have a preserve FDA a trial is going to start in April. So we will going to see more adjudicated core lab CT-based data soon, but also it will be no surprise that we are going to learn more about these anatomical scenarios where we should maybe not use the device. And my gut feeling is that if you have a large entry in the subclavian, left subclavian artery, then you will see perfused uh, uh, true lumen, uh, false lumen in the arch. The question is still, is it still a good solution in the middle of the night to get mild perfusion solved? And then maybe be a little more liberal to do a kind of an early carotid subclavian bypass and occlude the subclavian. This could also evolve as a strategy in selected cases. But I think the more communication you have in the head vessels, the higher the likelihood you will still have some perfusion left. I, I agree with uh, Professor Kempfert there. The the cases where we have seen uh, proximal descending thoracic aortic growth uh, have been with the very large communications between true and false lumen in the left subclavian vessel. And, you know, I, I think my personal uh, understanding uh, of these communications has definitely changed or uh, actually developed uh, with our experience at the AMDS where prior to uh, this device, these are things I think that no real aortic surgeon really didn't, this, these concepts never really crossed our mind, but I agree. I think that there will come a point where if you potentially, for example, have all three head vessels with communication, not just dissection, but the communication, you know, that patient may be better served with a, a total arch replacement. It depends. Uh, I think you touched this before, but it depends. Uh, to my perspective, having a limited experience, but uh, with uh, seeing this ent enthusiastic reaction of uh, basically everybody in the team, there is no one looking with suspicion at the technology. It depends on what the alternative is, because as you as you pointed out, if uh, if the patient you you route to the AMDS are those that otherwise would have been good candidates for for uh, total arch or frozen uh, and trunk, I'm with you. Uh, like uh, like Jörg says, uh, we have to keep a word of caution because young guy like the lady of the last case, but without the mitral uh, repair, without the cardiomyopathy, without uh, a tear in the total detachment of the right, car uh, the right coronary, then she is a good uh, total arch or uh, frozen elephant trunk uh, candidate. But uh, the reality, looking at the registries and even the NORCAD, which is European, is that uh, uh, basically 90% of the patients do not get this, uh, this, uh, this type of treatment. And nevertheless, two-thirds of the patients are exactly this type of uh, dissection. So, I think uh, in, in my place, for instance, uh, all of the patients we, we routed to the MDS would have been uh, 
would have been treated uh, a few years ago, it would have been treated a little bit uh, uh, in a simplistic way, in a more simplistic way, trying to, to be, uh, uh, try not to replace too much, try not to cool too much, try not to, to go into circ arrest, uh, because most of the surgeon, actually reality is, uh, as far as Jörg is doing the surgery or, or Michael, uh, and possibly in the day, it's, uh, well, you can do nearly whatever, but if, you, if it is uh, somebody else, maybe with uh, a limited experience, like most of our colleagues in aortic dissection, in most centers, and in the night and maybe alone, then uh, having the MDS there on the shelf, I think it, 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 it's really a good companionship. And this is where our AMDS patients are coming out from. It's sort of a stepping up the procedure, not a simplifying that from uh, from frozen and from track. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, as Jörg was saying, if there is fenestrations uh, within your head vessels, you are going to, you may not see that during initially during your uh, scan. And subsequently, we'll have to deal with it. And it may be that you can percutaneously, even through the fenestrations, uh, deal with it or do your crossovers um, and tie the, the branch off. Maybe a better short and long term outcome for these patients um, rather than trying some complex uh, debranching, which can get you in a lot of trouble depending on where you're, you know, where you end up. Um, so uh, I think it's still a, a good option and we're going to find out obviously with with time now we've really gone over the time limit uh, i have to say but it's it's impressive obviously everyone is is eager to hear what uh, our expert uh, uh, speakers have had to say because there's still well over 100 people online um i think this might be a good time to wrap up jane is that would that be uh, Right, so I'd just like to thank our, our three speakers, obviously Dr. Moon, Professor Kempfert, and Professor Benussi uh, for their great presentations um, and answering uh, all our questions. Obviously, I think we've covered uh, most of the topic and uh, we look forward to seeing more of this AMDS device and the data that's gonna be coming out. But uh, once again, thank you to Artivion for um, organizing the event.